Hello and welcome to the Path 11 Podcast with your host, Mike and April. April this week is on assignment. This week's guest is Graham Nichols. Graham is the English author of Avenues of the Human Spirit and Navigating the Out-of-Body Experience. He has now been researching and developing his out-of-body experiences for more than 28 years. Graham is also a pioneer in the field of immersive art and technology, which he began developing in 1998 to international acclaim. His focus on science has led him to work alongside Dr. Rupert Sheldrake on research into telepathy and precognition, gaining the highest score ever in a single test in Dr. Sheldrake's precognition experiment. Last year, he took part in Dr. Dean Radin's quantum slit psychokinesis experiment at the Institute of Noetic Sciences in California, once again with positive results. He has also been teaching in the field of OBE since 1991. He now teaches via his online navigator course, personal tuition, exclusive workshops, and lectures at ventures including Cambridge University, the Society for Psycho Research, the Institute of Noetic Sciences, and the Rhine Research Center. You can find articles, videos, and more information at GrahamNichols.com. All those will be in the show notes. So let's go to part one with our interview with Graham Nichols. All right, Graham Nichols, uh, welcome to the show. It's great to be here. Now, you're in Estonia, is that correct? I am, yes. And uh, I should probably have looked at a map before the show. <laughs> I know you, that's, uh, you're several hours ahead of us. That's um, What part of Europe is that? Uh, it's just south of Helsinki, Finland, and just... Uh, just to the east of uh, Stockholm, I'm almost parallel with uh, Stockholm. Since you're new to the podcast, uh, would you want to explain how you got into doing OBEs, um, out-of-body experiences? Well, for me, it started when I was very young. I, I initially had uh, other experiences, not specifically out-of-body experiences, but um, seeing an apparition when I was around five years old. And also having an awareness of what you could maybe uh, see as past life type glimpses. I don't really know what they were, but I had various images that felt very much like memories when I was a, a young child in primary school. Um, so that was very uh, apparent to me from, from very early on. And then when I got to about 12 years old, I started to have spontaneous, very fleeting out-of-body experiences where I would find myself not above myself in my bedroom as is the classic description but I would find myself um, maybe floating just above the ground around half a mile from where I lived and I would see a vivid scene with uh, people moving around the buildings um, the details of everything the concrete the metal everything would be very very vivid um, and then a split second later, I would be back in the room that I was uh, physically in. So it would be like a moment of my reality had just switched to being in a completely different place. And then I would be back in the room that I started in. So it was a very uh, strange experience and not really like the classic out-of-body experience that, that is often described. But that's how it started for me. And I, I know with... Um when you say classic out of body experience, that's where you you kind of you're sleeping in bed, and all of a sudden you're standing next to the bed, looking at yourself sleeping. Is that what you mean by classic? Yeah, usually uh, we'll be laying on the bed, not necessarily sleeping, but on on a bed often, um, and then the person will find themselves above their body, looking straight down. It's the really classic scenario was described right back in the. 1920s and 30s by people like Sylvan Muldoon, um, who was really the the person who popularized and made all of these ideas really known to the public. And I, I've been noticing, like when we we spoke to William um, in the past, and uh, Teal Swan is another one, for example, that's that's had OBEs, and even Tom Campbell, who's not a big OBE guy, but he does have the ability uh, to do it pretty well. It, it it seems to be that the more adv advanced you get, that you don't usually have the classic OBE. Is that 
similar to you? That, have you noticed? Yeah, yeah. I, I think that does seem to be pretty across the board. The people I work with, the the the, the people that you've mentioned. Yeah, it seems to be that. I think we start off with quite a clear um, conception of ourself as a as a physical body, as a, a body in in the physical world. Uh, you know, we have quite a strong identity, if you like, at the beginning. Um, and as the experience unfolds, as we become more comfortable in that state of being, then our focus on being a physical form and a particular person, a particular gender, etc., all of that seems to dissolve away over time. And we, we connect to a, a more expansive form of consciousness and a more expansive uh, type, type of experience. Um, and I think that's uh, something that's akin to something like meditation or other spiritual practices where you you start off with you know, you've got the day-to-day -day thoughts and the day-to-day -day understandings in your mind. And as you develop with the process, that seems to dissolve away and you find yourself on a more expansive level. So, yeah, that that's definitely consistent across people, I think. And with the uh, the more advanced OBE, where you're, you're kind of almost like dropped into a, like a new location. Is... Uh, does like for you does it le when you say have one experience and it's in say location a and then you come back to your body then the next time you go out do you continue in location a or could it be like another random location in my case the locations are usually different um i'll usually find myself in a completely different place and it's it's very interesting as time's gone on as well um, the distance and the, the types of places that I'll find myself has expanded uh, by quite a lot. Um, so, for example, early on, my outer body experiences would often be physically around my body or, like I mentioned, maybe half a mile from, from where I was. Uh, but then as, as I developed with the experience, I will now often find myself on the other side of the world. I could find myself floating over Cuba or floating over the oceans of um, of the Arctic or something like that. It could be anywhere and then it could be on a completely different, uh, what seems to be a different level of reality altogether or, or could be some kind of huge interconnected consciousness, something like that, uh, where you experience millions of minds all at once is, is how it feels. Um, so there's a there's a whole range of uh, possibilities to the nature of the reality of the experience and you've gotten i i take it you're pretty proficient now and you can kind of ch kind of choose almost where you want to go is that true i i can uh choose to some degree but what i tend to do is go with the flow of the experience because as i've developed with my practice of this i tend to feel that in, in many ways, there's an intention or there's a, there's a kind of purpose sometimes behind the journey that I'll go on if I allow it to unfold. So it's almost like I'll trust my unconscious or um, whatever it is that's guiding me in that process. I'll, I'll allow it to unfold and see, see where it takes me. And often I find that the experience is much more profound or, or, or will give me some insight into something that maybe I wasn't aware of before and then maybe years later I'll discover some significance to it. There was an interesting scenario with that recently where back in 2012 I had an out-of-body experience where I found myself over one of the moons of Saturn called Ipicus. Um, I was moving over the surface of this moon and I noticed the distinct characteristics of it, that it has a, um, a kind of ridge that moves through the the center of the moon and then one side of the moon is, is discolored. Um, and I, for quite a while, I wondered what the significance of this moon might be. And I, I don't, you know, I, I didn't really know why I would be drawn there. But then interestingly, just recently, Courtney Brown and his uh, remote viewing project uh, that he that he does, the Farsight Institute, they've just uh, done a project on that exact moon. And they're now starting to put forward ideas that there's some kind of uh, alien connection or something like that with the moon. I don't know how I feel about that or whether that's true, but it's very interesting how sometimes a place that 
seems completely insignificant and I would have no idea why I would be drawn there at a later date sometimes information arises that makes something like that uh, more more interesting or more significant that actually brings up the next question I was thinking of uh, you you also have a YouTube video um, that you posted where you kind of predicted the future mm. um, it was a terrorist attack in, in that it city. Was, yeah, it was a terrorist attack in London. Um, I, it was my most um, intense and powerful out-of-body experience, but it was also unique in the literature on the subject because when I had the experience, there were four other people in the room with me. I was actually teaching um, the G technique, which is one of the main techniques that I use to induce out-of-body experiences. So I was teaching this to a small uh, group of friends um, who were interested in these kinds of areas and I went into this very intense out of body experience it came over me like a, a really um, really overwhelming force really and I, I went down onto floor level and then the next thing I knew I was moving through a, a sort of jungle type environment a very natural environment um, and then that environment seemed to break away. It was almost like the scene uh, dissolved, or but it was very abrupt. It just sort of broke. And then the next thing I knew, I was standing on the corner of Moore Street and Old Compton Street in Soho in central London. And as I stood there, I watched this explosion burst out from the right-hand side of the street, and I saw the sort of chaos and um, that ensued after the explosion. And then the next thing... I felt was this intense um, emotional wave hit me, like I felt the anguish and the emotion of the people who were in that particular attack. Um, and as I felt that, it brought me away from the scene, but I went into a kind of, I would describe it as something like a womb-like state. Um, by this point in the room, uh, people who were physically there in the room were getting concerned that I was having a very um, powerful experience. So one of them especially was trying to coax me back out of the out of the state and he slowly brought me out of this womb-like state and I came back to normal consciousness. And as I came back to normal consciousness, I uh, we made a circle and I, I described what I'd seen and I had this strong feeling that it was a precognitive event, that I'd seen something from the future. The whole thing had been a bluish grey. It was like it wasn't fully formed or something. And I was seeing uh, something that would happen at another time. So I described this to everyone who was present. Uh, and I, I'd i never had any precognitive experience before. So it wasn't like I'd mentioned these things on a regular basis or anything like that. I was, you know, I was just for the first time very sure that this was going to be precognitive. And then five days later, there was a bombing exactly on that street in the position that I described it in that experience. So in the video that you're talking about, one of the witnesses who was there also describes uh, his his version of what he remembers from that day. So um, it, it's a very unique and powerful experience, I think, in the in the literature on the subject. Yeah, that that's pretty amazing. Um my my jaw dropped when I when I saw that video, because uh, <laughs> here in the United States, the, uh, the you know the last big terror attack that we had was nine eleven, and mm. um, I, I I used to work about about an hour and a half or so north of New York City, so a lot of my coworkers had relatives and friends that actually were in the building when the uh, towers fell in. Uh, the World Trade Center, and yeah. I've also heard a lot of stories too how they were kind of pulled away, like not that they knew something was going to happen, but something kept them from going to work that day. Mm. And there was almost like a a pre uh, cognitive. Uh, I don't know if all of them were pre cognitive, but I know a lot of them for some reason there was some unexpected delay, like the train was late or car wouldn't start I, I i just think that you know when there's some big i i guess basically my question i guess is did you do you think with your um future obe that you actually save somebody uh, like in your circle or 
I, you... I think possibly myself, actually, um, or, or possibly um, close friends who who weren't actually there. Maybe my my partner at the time. We would we were due to go for dinner in Soho, um, at an Italian restaurant that we often visited on that particular street on that day that the actual bombing happened. And after I had that experience, I, I wouldn't say that I completely avoided the area, but uh, because I, I worked nearby that area. Um, but what I did was that particular day, I just felt maybe I wouldn't go for dinner that day, and then and then the explosion happened. So possibly it had an impact on on my choices, and and therefore my my partner's choice as well. Okay. And have you had any more future OBEs that you that you can tell? I, I I had another experience of the the seven seven uh, bombings that took place in two thousand and five. Um, that was uh, that was the one um, that I guess the our London's equivalent of um, the nine eleven events. Um, and a series of bombs went off across London um, on two trains and also on uh, buses um the outer body experience i had this was a very unique experience as well in many ways because i was fully conscious and walking um down the stairs of my of my apartment where i lived in in east london at the time i was walking down the stairs and i just felt basically the vibrational state the early stages of the outer body experience and the whole environment seemed to be uh, magnified, like there was energy coming from the cupboards and the and the and the room, the kitchen uh, area that I was walking into. So I knew that this was something powerful, and I knew that this was something to do with the out body experience. Now I could have resisted it and not gone with it, and just maybe shut that energy down, but because that had never happened before while I was just walking around, I felt that this was something significant, so maybe I should go with it. So I went into my studio at the back of the at the back of the kitchen and I just um laid down and went into uh, the out body experience. And the next thing I found was I was moving above uh the Moorgate area of London, which is sort of East Central London, um, and I was quite high up, but I moved down over the street and I went straight through the the tarmac of the of the of the street and down and I through the tarmac and I found myself in the middle of a tunnel, um, but I was floating over the tracks. So if you imagine the train tunnel, I was over the tracks and I was facing the the platform where people stand and I could see the sign opposite me uh, with Moorgate written on the wall. Um, Then I got a sense that up ahead of me there was the train had already gone ahead. So I started to follow the train um, into the tunnel and I reached the back of the train um, and stopped and then the train pulled away. And I then at that point I felt I shouldn't follow. So I stayed at the entrance to what would have been Liverpool Street Station. The train was pulling out of Liverpool Street Station, and then the next thing, um, a little while later, was another explosion at a distance. So interestingly, I was maybe around 150 metres from the explosion in both experiences. And also this experience had the blue-grey quality that I'd experienced in the previous Soho experience as well but the the explosion happened and then I also felt the emotional wave hit me in the chest much like I'd had in the previous experience and that brought me back to my body and then um, I came out back into normal awareness but in that particular experience it was um it was a longer period of time. Unfortunately, I, I didn't get all the, the dates recorded as perfectly as I had in the last experience. So um, I'm not sure of the exact period of time, but it was it was quite a while before it actually took place. But again, 
um, the explosion took place on on the Circle Line or the um, that that line that goes in through East London. So, yeah, those are the only two, though. <laughs> okay. Now, the, the, this blue gray type hue that's put over the your experience is that? Do you think that's a marker to kind of, or maybe your marker to kind of say, hey, this is this is going to happen, or this might happen. Uh, or is this, or if you had that blue grayish uh, tint on other experiences? I've had it in three experiences. Um, the two precognitive experiences and one that was a very veridical, verified experience that happened where I went into the top floor of a building and was able to um, accurately describe the environment and, and the and some uh, the letterhead paper. It was a this happened in the late nineties, and there was some letterhead paper with text, uh, and I was able to not get all of the text, but I got the name of the person that lived there, and then also, as I'd been travelling to the the building, I'd passed one of the signs in the street that in London have W eleven, which means West eleven, so that's the kind of postal district for that part of London. So I knew his name and. I knew the the area because of where I travelled, and also I had the the postcode. So, from those three pieces of information, I was able to verify that that person did live at that address, and then I was able to retrace it on foot. Um, so those are the the only three experiences I've had that have had that blue grey quality to them. And now, um, have you? had any experiences where you've gone into the past and relived an experience or uh, maybe a past life or maybe a, even a historical event? Have you been able to have that experience? I've had several that would suggest um, past lives. Um, one to do with a, an Asian man in London um, during the, the sort of late Victorian age. Um and also some connections. For example, I I wrote some text uh, in in the the early two thousands. I I started to have these images, and I started to write write them down to, to sort of do text. Um, and then a a woman, a friend of mine from Pakistan, came over to my to my uh, apartment, and in the studio that I did all my work in I had these uh, pieces of text uh, placed around the walls and she came in and she asked me who who'd done them and I said I did and she was quite surprised because she then told me that they were Arabic the text was Arabic um, I asked her what they said but she said they don't really say anything but they're Arabic letters spaced out on on tech on, on the sheets of paper so um, I had all these sort of connections with uh, areas of uh, what would have been at the time India, but is now modern day Pakistan. Um, so I, I don't know what all that means, but it was uh, it, it's very interesting kind of pieces of information that I've pieced together over the years. And another out of body experience that involved going back in time was an experience where. The apartment block I grew up in, which had 20 floors, it was a very tall building. I came out of the window of the of the floor that I lived on to go into the, the main road, which is a large Roman road that runs through London. So it's, it's been there for a very long time. I came out into that road expecting to see it as the modern day. But as I came out into the road, in fact, what I saw was Victorian London. I saw horses and carts i saw um colorful uh street traders i saw people in formal dress i saw um very low level buildings and i and i looked behind me and instead of seeing a built up um you know central city environment that i would expect in in london i i looked around and i saw grass and open areas of like field land and um i think there was a small chapel or something but pretty much other than that it was it was totally empty so um 
that was like stepping back in time for a moment and seeing a glimpse of how how the area that I grew up in looked in in the past and it was it was amazingly vivid and very beautiful and it was very interesting to move along the street I remember trying to notice if there were distinctive turns in the street or buildings that I could recognize or things like that um and I traveled maybe half the length of the street before the experience sort of pulled me back and it sort of dissolved and I came back to my physical body. Now, I've heard, you know, you go on YouTube and you, you put on, you know, you search out-of-body experience and, you, you know, you, you see William and Tom Campbell um, and there's a couple others like uh, Robert Bruce. I don't know if you're familiar with, with him at all. Sure, yeah. And a lot of them, I, I know, like Tom doesn't talk about his experiences that much, at least on the record. And I know with Robert Bruce in particular, he talks about he, he's explored this, you know, physical universe like the Earth and some, you know, the solar system like like you had mentioned. But they go to you know other, almost like universes that with different physics and different laws or different laws of physics, and different creatures have you had any experience like that um i've had many yeah but but i guess um that's where maybe i i sort of agree with tom campbell on, on that level um that i think if we get too much into the sort of subjective levels of my ex particular experience then it it tends to it can color you know what what happens with other people and things like that and i think that's why tom doesn't really talk very much about his own experiences my take on it is if it's in this reality then it's something that we can we can cross reference if you like we can share it we can talk about it to some degree but um i do talk about the other level experiences but i try to focus more on the objective ones, the ones that that are in the sort of um, consensus reality, or if you like, because that way we can get some idea of whether it it is a, a an objective, real thing, or whether it's something. You know, it's it's hard to say. Even for myself, I have this experience. Can I be totally sure that that experience I had of the Victorian London? Can I be totally sure that it was objectively real? Well. I can't really, and I think I have to maintain a high degree of humility and openness to, you know, that we just don't know. We don't know the answers to many of these questions. So I think when it comes to the big questions of other levels of reality, I find them fascinating, especially when I mentioned earlier, for me it tends to become almost like a meditational thing. The other levels, if you like, tend to be like a huge interconnected consciousness so it's like experiencing the thoughts or the the emotions the wants the desires all of those things of millions of people um it's like uh connecting to a huge network that's how it how it feels to me and and through that i gain huge insights and i get a, a, a very very profound sense of of reality and and of my place in reality um but at the same time uh I, I, I think my aim is I really want people to uh, to sort of explore that for themselves in many ways and, and to and to sort of see what see what's there and, and that's why I think the things that we can all share the objective experiences are the most fascinating to me yeah and we, we kind of you know hosting this podcast and, and doing these films you know we kind of have to dance a fine line between how much should we share you know how much should we let the guests share you know because a lot of people listening to this are you know like me trying to you know starting out having out-of-body experiences and when you hear some outrageous story about how it was some other universe you know the water was black and you know whatever the sand was purple you know and you see <laughs> different creatures you kind of mm. almost expect to have you know you don't want to have to expect that to happen on your out-of-body experience so i get that too that you know you you can't always go to there so you have to you know kind of reflect on what we can share with one another that you know like you said it's um what, what is it objective uh this physical universe and you know we can 
compare, you know, like, oh, we see a tree, it's got green leaves, you know, you can kind of compare that with everyday life, I guess. Um, yeah, I mean, it's it's not perfect, but I think when we when we can do that, that's I think that kind of thing really challenges uh, whether you know whether these things are kind of real. And, and when you look at the science in like near death experiences, for example, and Janice Holden mentioned that in her research, ninety two percent of near death experiences when they're out of body what they perceive is accurate about the world around them. Um, and I think that's really fascinating because you have this, we have this paradigm that's saying that, the, you know, these things are just hallucinations or dreams. And, and, and in many ways, when you, when you do hear stories of black water and, you know, uh, strange beings and things like that, it kind of undermines a lot of the, the sort of work to give these things um, some scientific credibility and to really look into these things as well because you know maybe that person was dreaming i mean often people do unfortunately confuse our body experiences with dreams i think especially if they have their experiences through a dreaming state i think they tend to be a bit more subjective then it's very hard how do you really prize the two apart how do you really prize what is objective and what is subjective when you when you're in this kind of half conscious state anyway. Um, I think that's why I tend to focus in my own practice on, on having experiences from a conscious state. I don't go to sleep when I have my out of body experiences. I have them from a, from a semi waking state, just a sort of relaxed, calm state. So that way it allows me to maintain a degree of objectivity in the experience, I think, or maybe a greater level of it. Um, and I think that's why, a lot of my experiences, I, I can identify an objective level to them, a veridical level, as they would say in the in the near death experience research. But I think I think all of that's really really fascinating. And the the transcendent levels, it's a bit like I guess like in deep meditation when you experience that ultimate oneness and that sense of non duality and that sense of everything is interconnected and those absolutely transcendent states you can't put that into words you can't describe that to someone there's in in many ways there's not not much point in in some senses in describing that i think it's so my focus in a way is to describe the the journey the the road that leads to those um transcendent powerful experiences and that's really where i want to put my focus that's uh you kind of brought up a good point there about comparing OBEs to lucid dreaming, for example. And I, I've mentioned this in past shows as well that I've had experiences where I don't know if it's a lucid dream or not. I did have control. I knew that I wasn't in my body. I knew, you know, I was somewhere else interacting with beings, but I don't know, the quality of it seemed to be like a dream. But then I've had experiences where this was something else. It was kind of like going from, you know, color television from like the 1980s to high definition television. There was a quality difference. You still had the interactiveness with uh, other beings. And it's like you kind of come back and you, you feel like your body is heavy. Do you want to talk about that, you know, with the differences? And you even actually have an article on your website about, seven. I think it's called 17 Reasons um, OBEs and Lucid Dreaming are Different. Do you want to talk about that at all? Sure, yeah. Well, well, I, I guess my perspective is um, I wanted to try and answer that question. That's the, the article that I wrote came from the fact that that's a very common question is, you know, what really is the difference? And I, I guess... It seems that that's something that's become more of an issue in recent years than it than it was when I was starting to learn these things, for example, because early on i I learned through methods like the body of light method, for example, that was common at the time, and I read books where people would often talk about having a conscious experience, so they were laying down with the intention of having an out body experience, and there was no talk of dream or sleep or any of those kinds of things. And if anything, 
out-of-body experiences were connected more with clairvoyance or remote viewing or things like that. It was more a remote perception, a non-local consciousness or something like that. So, um, but then, so I never really encountered this uh, issue that uh, of of you know having out of body experiences from a from a dreaming state i knew people did it in that way but it wasn't the most common form at the time but over time that's that shifted and there's been a lot more people combining lucid dreaming and i think that we should just look at it in a very simple sense really i think it's it's not it's not necessary to make it too complicated i think if you look at it that we know that dreams are very much linked with our own psychology and and they usually take place when we're in this sort of half conscious half unconscious state even a lucid dream it's not quite the same level of conscious awareness usually that we would have in our normal waking sense for example robert wagner one of the leading lucid dream experts said to me that his memory of the early part of the lucid dream will dissolve as the lucid dream progresses. So as he gets closer to the end of the lucid dream, the beginning part of the dream will become harder to remember and it will sort of dissolve to some degree. Um, I think when we know that the memory factors are not as clear and we also know that the subjective factors are stronger in a dream state, I think that when you describe the experience like, like you just did of a very vivid powerful experience but there was also some question mark for you i think that probably what we're dealing with is is the sort of crossover point where consciousness i think all consciousness is probably on a continuum and as you if you're at one end of the continuum when you're when you're having a very conscious fully aware out of body experience it's probably closer or as close as you're going to get to the physical reality that we're usually used to or the or at least the level of conscious awareness in this reality that we're usually used to and as you move along that continuum and you go closer to the subjective to the psychological to the unconscious the the, the more the line becomes harder to define so i think that's that's generally how i how I look at it. And I think uh, in that article with the 17 points, I'm trying to really highlight things that really do say that there's some difference in the state, because I think it's very useful to say that an out body experience is one thing and a lucid dream is another thing. We know they are interconnected at some point, but then everything is, and all consciousness is. But if we're going to fully understand them and study them and learn more about them, then I think we have to know as much as possible about that particular state of being. And I think that the, uh, the outer body experience, for example, it will take place in a near death experience when someone's had a cardiac arrest in that kind of state. There's no psychological factor. There's no, uh, dream state. There's no, uh, dream brain waves or anything like that it suggests that the consciousness is completely separate and experiencing something separately. Um, that's just one example, but there's a, there's a whole range in, in that particular article where I, where I try to sort of identify things that show that there is a clear difference. But, but I think also you find sometimes that people focus more on that gray area that I just mentioned. And so maybe their experiences are less clearly defined than others. It, it will depend on the individual to some degree too. And I, I know that kind of brings up, uh, kind of goes right into my next question about skeptics, especially when, you know, you have a skeptic that's, and this is kind of how I was very early on. Um, and it was kind of like, I think I was out of body, but I'm pretty sure that was a dream. You know, then, and I, I'm sure there's other skeptics out there that's had that same issue. But then of course mine, learning has experience yeah i've gained experience and i'm not i'm not a skeptic anymore but i know there's still people that are skeptic there's even skeptics that won't even i know at least my uh local community here there's there's people that won't even talk about this stuff and do you want to talk about your dealing with skeptics because i know you've dealt with skeptics in the past um you know and especially where I guess where science and research has kind of, I, I guess it's only, it's only gone so far and it's got to, I don't know. 
I guess there's got to be more proof if, if, if that's, I don't know if I'm ex asking the question right, but. Um, yeah, well, uh, well, I, th I think, um, I think we do need, we need more research is, is the key. I mean, often skeptics will assume that, that research happening is, is a very easy thing um, to do. And, oh, you know, you just walk up to a scientist and say, let's do some research. But actually, science doesn't really work like that. And um, most scientists who are working in the field of parapsychology are looking at specific components, if you like, of what you would describe as an out-of-body experience. So precognition, presentiment, uh, clairvoyance, uh, micro PK, um, remote viewing, all these different types of psi ability um, within the laboratory context. Um, Out-of-body experiences as such, the main evidence and research has really been in the field of near-death experiences. Like I mentioned, Janet Holden's, Janice Holden, sorry, um, her research looking at the whole the whole field, the entire literature, and she found that 92% was uh, totally accurate um, in their perceptions while out of body. Um, then when you look at psychical research and you look at the components, things like remote viewing um, or, or precognition, etc., you see that there are there's a huge body of data that's got very, very strong evidence for it, stronger than in, in many areas of mainstream science. A recent study, for example, uh, that Dean Radin identified looked at the uh, idea of precognition. It was a meta-analysis, which means looking at a whole body of different studies in, in a big group and looking at them statistically to see if there's any sign across all these different institutions of of the effect being real. And in this particular study with over 80 um, institutions involved, it was found that the statistical significance was in the region of Six Sigma, which is basically a bigger effect than the Higgs boson that was recently discovered in CERN. Um, so when you start to think in those terms, um, there is a, a huge body of data that shows that these things are real and I've taken part in laboratory experiments and I have my witnessed uh, experiences as well um, so I think you know I'm, I'm really trying to help put these these things out there and all the experiments I've taken part in have been um, positive results as well so I think you know I'm, I'm really trying to to do more with that and I've contacted multiple scientists in terms of continuing that work I hope to do some work at the Rhine Research Center in the US uh, later um, you know maybe next year or something like that so and that's going to be looking at whether a physical interaction with the out-of-body experience can be demonstrated. So that's a very exciting area as well, because I, I don't know of any real research on that idea, at least since the, the 60s or maybe a few things in the 80s, but really not nothing very recently. So it's all a really exciting area. And, and usually when I debate with skeptics, um, they'll be very unaware of this kind of research and that's something that we need to change across the scientific establishment. We need to make people aware that there is a huge body of evidence for 130 plus years that show these things are real. Um, but most scientists are just unfortunately unaware of them for some some reason. The, uh, like I, I was just thinking of, you know, you kind of see it, trickling into mainstream uh media kind of like with at least with hollywood uh there's been a, a string of movies that came out recently uh called insidious have you seen them i i saw the first one yeah okay. I, I guess it was quite a quite a negative depiction really wasn't it yeah and um, there's yeah there's uh that, that's the same one i saw and it it, uh, it, it kind of you know the, the, there's well of course this is hollywood trying to sell a movie ticket so it's kind of like you know to sell a ticket they need to put you know fear into it there's always that mm. fear behind it and i i we're trying to put a, a at least a positive view on it and I, I don't know if you want to talk about you know how 
the negative side of you know how mainstream looks at it currently it, it's yeah. it's it's quite unfortunate in a way that things like what's depicted in the film there's 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 a bit of a um a belief that that there's a neg- negative aspect to this kind of experience and i think that's totally false i think it's actually quite the opposite i think in my life i've experienced a growth of compassion that led me to become vegan i've experienced a growth of health where i've my you know i virtually never get sick i'm you know have a a really high degree of well-being i have a an inner calm that many people comment upon you know there's there's a, been a real shift and a real change in my uh sense of self and, and my whole journey spiritually with this experience and i think the out body experience is actually almost like if we think about ideas like the soul or or a or a core essential part of a human being that is that is the part that's uniquely them then I think the out-of-body experience is one of the most direct ways that we can experience that. We're essentially experiencing the human spirit. We're experiencing our our true self to some degree. So I really think that's the the value of this experience. And it's really unfortunate when there's a when you know Hollywood or or whoever associates it with with something negative especially when i actually think that the vibrational state and many of these sort of uh, states that you get into can actually even bring about physical healing and and uh, and are akin possibly to something like reiki or or some other um healing modality so uh, yeah I, I think uh it's it's really unfortunate that those those things get out there but i guess um in the commercialization of things, there's always a degree of exploitation and removing the the things that really matter, the humanity and the and the truth of of the experiences that people have. I think that's true in in all areas. If you look at music, there's always a you know it, the music that you get in the mainstream is not the the best music that's out there. The the politics that we get in the mainstream is not the best politics that we could have. The you know all of these areas that it, it because it's about commerce and it's about exploitation. There's there's rarely that um, humanity that that I think spirituality and these kinds of practices really remind us of. And- when we've talked to other out of body experts like like William Buellman, for example, he's he always brings up his experiences when he overcomes fear in an OBE. Mm. Um, like he will confront a some sort of creature that you would see, like something from a horror movie. He would see, and once he overcomes it and is not fearful of it, it, it he kind of experiences a level of growth, I guess. And mm. he's able to, to expand his OBE experience uh, from that. Do you find that uh, to be similar in your case? I don't really have um, negative uh, experiences or creatures or anything of that nature in, in my experience. Um, but I guess in, in nightmares and things like that, my friend and lucid dream expert, Charlie Morley, um, uh, describes this idea of in his lucid dreams if he encounters some monster or something like that that he'll he'll turn around and he'll say um, what part of myself do you represent and I always like that idea that if we experience something negative or 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 frightening in some way that there's a part of ourselves that that's expressing or a fear that that's expressing or something of that nature so I like the idea of um, asking that kind of question in that kind of context. So that's really, I guess, how I would take it. That, that's that's a really good tool to have to to just say something like that. That's yeah, yeah. That's pretty clever. Because I I think back to my exp- I haven't had any negative experiences yet or anything like what William ha- has talked about. And actually, when I think about it, I don't think I've had a nightmare since I was you know i don't know 12 years old or so so <laughs> <laughs> yeah uh, me, me neither really so it, it is a it's a hard thing to talk about the negative side of the experience because <laughs> I, I don't have one really and it, it's uh 
but there's it, it's a common fear i guess it's funny because there's a fear that there's something fearful within the experience but i can really say hand on heart that i've experienced the absolute opposite that it's been the most transformative blissful um life affirming experience i've ever had and healing everything you know quite quite far from anything you could even remotely call um negative yeah and uh, when i think back to the nightmares that i was having i was uh, and i've you know once again i've said this before in previous shows where i grew up in a very religious um family and so it was always some sort of conflict with my beliefs trying to escape my reality i don't know if that's the right way to put it but <laughs> there's always some sort of guilt involved where it's like oh you shouldn't really be reading about you know which we call it uh trying to be psychic or anything like that you just gotta you know that was always mm. frowned upon and it probably played a lot into my subconscious when i was sleeping but uh and then of course shortly after that you know you get tied up with school and college and work and you kind of put that stuff aside and until now you know like at least for me it was i was almost 30 when i had that uh awakening and started having trying to research near-death experiences uh, out of body experiences and now it's it's all just like a really positive experience no matter what you know i come across um mm. and i, I kind of want to bring back about um your childhood when you had that apparition mm. i've had a i had a similar apparition when i was about five years old i was laying in bed uh my parents were downstairs watching tv and you, you know you, the lights are off but you kind of see like the hallway light in the in the bedroom and i could see this figure just appear like the back of his head and he just kind of turned around looked at me and then just like flew off into the ceiling and of course you know being five years old and seeing some strange person in your room you kind of i just took off and went down <laughs> told my parents about it and they said oh it was probably just a dream go back to bed you know now from what i've learned with out-of-body experiences do you think and this is how what i felt up and you know uh till now about that experience is that that apparition do you think you were in that in between that in between point where you're still connected with your body but you you some would say it was like astral sight does that make sense? Um, um, it, uh, it's possible. It's very hard to say because it was so long ago and my memory of it is is uh, vague. Um, but I, I wasn't in bed. That's that's one key point uh, okay. because I, I, I guess – um, some some people have, have have talked about sleep paralysis and things like that, but actually, I'd got up to go to the bathroom, um, and I'd walked out of my bedroom and I'd walked into the hallway of the of the apartment I grew up in, and the figure was in the doorway, standing at the doorway, basically out into the into the hall hall outside that led out to the street. Um, so it was standing there and it didn't move but it looked straight at me and I also looked away towards my parents bedroom tried to call out to them but I was really I was really frightened but nothing fearful or uh, problematic actually happened um, when I think back about it now I actually th feel it was quite a profound beautiful experience but at the time I was scared because I didn't know what it was and I didn't know, um, you know, I, it, it was so out of my reality even as a small child to see something like that. So I was frightened but, um, you know, it, nothing bad happened and I looked back and it seemed to be standing on the threshold between this reality and maybe another reality or something like that. It was like there was a, it was like there was space behind it, like it, like there was some kind of reality or, or level behind it. So, um, and it looked almost shamanic in some senses, very hard to describe. I mean, it, it, it in the, in the sort of half light, it was, it seemed like it was wearing either rags or feathers or some kind of, you know, almost like a tribal costume or something like that. So it was a very, it wasn't just like a normal figure. It wasn't just like a ghost or something like that. Um, which I have also seen actually very recently I saw a, 
a young woman in in the apartment that I live in now, and I I just got up in the middle of the night and was walking back to bed and turned the corner and there was a uh, a woman in a nightdress just standing looking across the the room uh, with long black hair. Um, I looked at her and she disappeared in a split second. So um, I've had that kind of more classic experience as well. Okay. Yeah, because I, I always, and that's, you know, another area of research that I'm looking into. Um, and I know that uh, there's a film, I, I believe it was some, uh, I can't remember his name, but it's called The Phase. And they kind of link that in between uh, out-of-body experience to uh, the physical experience. And it's usually right when you're going to bed, it's almost like a, uh, I don't know, maybe like a twilight kind of sense. Uh, well, there's the, the hypnagogic or hypnagogic state when you're going into sleep is is quite a common time for out-of-body experiences to occur. And then there's also the hypnopompic state, which is coming out of sleep. That's also a very common uh, point for the out-of-body experiences to occur. And often other types of experiences and OBEs often happen um, if you wake during the night as uh, as we just described, really. Um, so it, obviously when you're, when you're in those kinds of... Um, deep states of being half asleep half awake you're you're you've got to the point where your body is deeply relaxed so the focus is not on your physical body and and your your mind and your awareness can be more fluid and can move more easily etc and experience things more easily so i think that's really um what what it represents you can create that as i do from a waking state in order to induce the OBE through doing things like exhaustion or, or deep physical relaxation and things like that, but at the same time maintaining awareness. So by doing that, you create a state where you can go into an altered state, a trance, an out-of-body experience, etc. So um, the mechanisms behind, I think, all of the major mystical type experiences are quite similar in that sense. It's a it's when your awareness of the body is diminished. All spiritual practices have that focus. They either overwhelm the senses through something like drumming or dancing as you get in shamanic cultures, or, or you do it the other way where you sort of shut all the senses off by meditation or, or going into solitude or things like that. So I think uh, either way, there's this sense of going beyond the senses to allow that part, that core cool part of the self that exists beyond all of that. That's, you know, you allow that to come to the fore when you, when you transcend the senses. And that was part one with Graham Nichols. Be sure to tune in next week for part two, where we continue our discussion about out-of-body experiences. If you have a suggestion for our show, please contact us on our website at www.thepathseries.com. And please rate and review us in iTunes as well. You can also find our films at our website, as well as Vimeo.com, GuyMTV.com, Amazon.com, and iTunes. <laughs>